Hi right, guys, uh, welcome and uh, good morning once again. Hope you all are doing. Uh, we've started the recording and uh, uh, can I request uh, any one of us to please lead us uh, in prayer? Yeah, anyone, please uh, lead in prayer. We'll get started. Sure, Jeffrey. Go ahead. Thanks. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this beautiful day and for the beautiful class we are about to have. God, invite your Holy Spirit in as we start our class. Help us to open our mind and heart and listen to each and every word that Pastor says. Help us to understand it, God. Help us to not just be hearer of the words, but to also be the doers of the words, Jesus. We give you all the praise and all the glory. I place each and every one of my classmates into your hands. Be with them and guide them, Lord. And God, I pray for good Wi-Fi connections and everything else that we need. Uh, you be the starting and the ending. You speak with us, Jesus. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jafina. Great, guys. Um, so, yeah, uh, we've come on quite a journey in terms of uh, understanding uh, God's uh, idea, his heart, his desire for the local church. Uh, we've seen time and time again that uh, the church is his idea uh, and we are to follow his blueprint. Um, right. And so uh, in section two, we've been talking about uh, the, ch the church being the body of Christ, the family of God, uh, the pillar of truth, um, the bride, the army. Uh, right, and all these different uh, pictures and imageries um, that the scriptures has been uh, portraying the church to be right. And so today, we'll uh, we'll go on that same journey, uh, and uh, we'll learn about how the house of God is uh, called to be a house of prayer and worship. Right. Um, so we are in page eighty-seven. This is where our journey begins today. The local church, a house of prayer and worship. Okay, so, uh, and we see that, and I've said this so many times before, is from uh, God's heart, from uh, you know one recurring theme in the uh, in, in in the Bible, from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, is um, God saying, "I will be your God, and you will be my people." Right, I will be your God, and you will be my people, and you will see that or read that time and time again from the book of Genesis all the way to the Revelation. And on similar lines, we see that picture being painted uh, in Exodus chapter 19, verse uh, 3 to 6. Exodus 19, verse 3 to 6. Can I request uh, someone uh, to read that, please? One of us. <clears throat> Exodus 19, 3 to 6. Exodus chapter 19, verse 3 to 6. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special pleasure to me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of peace and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Yeah, thank you, Jafin. All right, so one of the things that stands out there is that uh, I mean, God starts off by saying that you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself uh, so he just didn't bring them out for the sake of bringing them out and just letting them free to run wild and chaotic in the promised land whatnot god is very specific i brought you out to myself right i've set you apart right i have called you out to myself that is um that is the calling of the church as well ecclesia a calling is is a church is set apart we are set apart to unto him unto god right 
Um, and now in verse 5 it says, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Exodus chapter 19 is a very crucial chapter in the book of uh Exodus, every chapter is important in that book, but uh, it's at this point, uh, the people of Israel had yet not rebelled, or the Ten Commandments had not yet given. And so God's heart once again for the entire was for the entire nation of Israel to be a priesthood and not just the tribe of Levi. Okay, uh, and then it was after the, I mean, after, after they kind of, uh, you know, went against the commandments, built their own golden calf and whatnot. And long story short, Moses comes in this most cinematic and the most dramatic way and says, um, who's on the Lord's side shall come this side, you know, and then the Bible says it, I'm not making this up, by the way. <laughs> okay, uh, and then we read that only the, it says all the Levites uh, ran towards him. Right, and so uh, the beginning of the Levitical priesthood, I would say, kind of begins from there. Okay, but God's heart is really for then was for the entire nation to be a priesthood, and we see that in the new covenant in First Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Uh, you also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house. Right, we've learned about how the local church is a spiritual house, right, in the earlier chapters. A holy priesthood. So now we are in the new covenant, right? And through what Jesus has done for us, uh, we are now a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, right? Um, through Jesus Christ. That's crucial, right? Time and time again, we would read that in the New Testament about uh, this thing. At the end, it will say, through Jesus Christ, or Paul will begin the statement saying, now therefore, through Jesus Christ, do this. Or he will end a statement by saying, through Jesus Christ. And so that's the key here, right? And so, and now as priests, okay, we, we know what the priests, what priests did in the Old Testament, right? They performed all these uh, sacrifices, rituals in, in, in the tabernacle, uh, right? They they were they were responsible for all these things right so and now we are called to serve and to minister unto god we are a holy priesthood called to offer spiritual sacrifices okay one thing about priests guys is they never went before god empty handed right they never went before god empty handed uh and and so we we are to minister unto him just as priests in the old we you know we offer spiritual sacrifices right uh, we offer him the fruit of our lips um you know that is the sacrifice of praise the hebrews says right and so yeah that's the first call uh, as to know that we are under the priesthood and not just priesthood we are royal priesthood right when other translation says and so uh, just if you were in a physical class, I would ask you to nudge your neighbor and say, "Is like, hey, what's a priest?" Because <laughs> you, you know, if you're not feeling like a priest, uh, too bad, because you're one, uh, <laughs> uh, right? So that's where we are at. And then that kind of another responsibility uh, of a priest, a priesthood, was uh, you know to keep the fire burning in the tabernacle in the sanctuary. Uh, Leviticus chapter 16, uh, 6, verse 12 and 13, in your notes, it says, And the fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it. It shall not be put out. And the priest shall burn wood on it every morning and lay the burnt offering in order on it. And he shall burn on it the fat of the peace offerings. Verse 13. A fire shall always be burning on the altar. It shall never go out. It shall never go out. Right? Um, and so once Moses has built the tabernacle uh, after the inauguration, we see that in Exodus chapter 40, uh, you know, after the inauguration of the tabernacle, uh, the first fire upon the brazen altar came from heaven. 
and you'll read about that in the book of Leviticus. Um, how many of your uh, favorite book is uh, Leviticus? <laughs> yeah, my my favorite book is Leviticus. Yeah, no, <laughs> no. Uh, not everybody's going to do that, isn't it? Uh, but uh, Book of Leviticus is is beautiful. It's uh, it's very crucial for us to understanding a lot of things. But then, so Leviticus chapter nine verse twenty four says, "The first fire upon the brazen altar came from heaven." Do you remember another instance where fire came from heaven? Elijah, First Kings eighteen. Uh, once again, the common factor there was altar. Here, the first fire upon the brazen altar. Right? And then the fire came. And so something tells us that it's very important for us to um, very briefly uh, build altars, and that altars represent a symbol of sacrifice, surrender. Right, so we have to build altars. Romans chapter twelve, verse one and two. Um, Paul writes, saying, "Offer yourselves as living sacrifice." Right. Um, so we all know that famous uh, popular scripture. So building an altar is one thing, and we are not only asked to build an altar; we are asked to be on the altar, living sacrifice. So once that happens, fire comes from heaven. Now, after the fire comes, it is our responsibility to keep the fire burning. It's God's responsibility to send the fire, but once he sends, it is our responsibility to keep the fire going, right? So fire falls on sacrifice. Uh, we provide the sacrifice. God provides his fire. Our continuous sacrifices of worship and prayer are fueled by the fire of God, right? Um, ongoing, never ceasing. So that's another responsibility of us as priests. What's the first thing? Is that we understand that we are a priesthood. Okay, and one of, and one of the responsibilities of the many uh, is that we ought to keep the fire burning. Okay. Um, the second uh, responsibility there is uh, we see, we read about it in Exodus chapter 30, verse 34 and 38, is the holy incense. Right? The Bible says, and the Lord said to Moses, take sweet spices, a stacte and onyxia and galbanum and pure frankincense with these sweet spices. There shall be equal amounts of each. So he's, he's specific, God. Like anything about we can learn about tabernacle is so detailed. Right? Uh, it's like God saying, okay, yeah, just put whatever you feel like doing, you know. You ask anybody, hey, how you did this? It's hey, it's very simple. I just put this, 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 and this, this, this came out. No, it's not that. God is so detailed. He's so specific. Okay, this, 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 and there shall be equal amounts of each. It's like almost like a, you know, a beautiful recipe there. And so you shall make these an incense, a compound according to the art of the perfumer, salted, pure, and holy. And you shall beat some of it very fine and some of it therefore the testimony in the tabernacle of meeting where I will meet with you and it shall be most holy to you but as for the incense which you shall make you shall not make any for yourselves according to its composition it shall be to you holy for the Lord that means separated set apart that ingredient it's it's mine. It's 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 set apart, right? Um, and whoever makes any like it uh, or to smell it, he shall be cut off from his people, right? So basically, the, the just there is anything offered to God must be holy and pure, right? And they, um, we can talk about the holiness of God uh, for as long as we want, and we will not come to an end. Of talking about his holiness um, right we can just do course after course after course and there, I don't think there's enough uh, doctorates that you can do to study on his holiness and say I have arrived I have learned everything that there is to be learned about the holiness of God uh, but then we can only pray because and, and ask for more encounters because 
our encounters with God takes place in the midst of holiness, right? because that's how he, he is holy. And we see that, isn't it? Everything we do, uh, you know, uh, we are encouraged uh, to do in that reverence, knowing that he is holy. So every, anything offered to God must be holy and pure. Right? So we are the priesthood. Uh, we are to keep the fire burning. God sends the fire. We are to build the altar, sacrifice. We are to be on the altar. right? And in the imagery that we have right now is, is what exactly Jesus, uh, Jesus did for us. Jesus was not only our offerer, offering, but he was also the offerer. Right? Uh, he just didn't build the altar, but he was on the altar. Right? He created the the wood, the cross, the tree. Uh, you know, the cross was made of. Right? Uh, and then he was the one on the altar. He was not only our sacrifice; he was also the high priest. Right? And we read all about it in the book of Hebrews, and that's where we are being encouraged when we say that we are in this priesthood. It's like, hey, remember all of this. Remember your teacher, your master, your you know your savior, Jesus. That's you know that's what I'm asking you. That's where we're going at, right? Um, and so everything presented, uh, offered to God, must be holy uh, and set apart and pure. Okay. Um, so remember, uh, we are again studying about the house of God being a house of prayer and worship. So what we read about in uh, or what we at least learn. Uh, from the tabernacle of Moses is that all of uh, these uh, these methods, this process was introduced, uh, the ornaments, so to speak, right? And then, much later, comes this person called David, right? So, and then we all know that uh, you know he built a tabernacle, uh, which was, which is known as the tabernacle of David or the tent of David, uh, you know, tent of meeting, whatever. Uh, now. David, along with the ornaments, he also introduces instruments, right? And so we read all about that. Um, in the notes, we are in page 88. It says, around 1000 BC, as an outflow of his heart, King David commanded that the Ark of the Covenant be brought up upon the shoulders of the Levites amidst the sound of songs and music instruments to his new capital, Jerusalem. Okay, so again, I think we all know the backdrop, the story behind this, where the Ark of the Covenant was captured. Um, the Ark of the Covenant um, was not with the people of the Covenant for almost 70 odd years. People of the Covenant were, you know, the people of Israel, right? So it was not with them for 70 odd years. And then, you know, 2 Samuel chapter 6, um, where the story kind of unfolds, where David after he's become the king of Jerusalem, Israel, and Judah, uh, he goes and brings the ark back. You know, once he brings it, tries to bring it on a bullock cart, fails. Uh, you know, uh, major flop. And then he takes. Uh, you know, he learns that Levites have to bring them back on their shoulders. So he, he does that, and then he pitches that on a mountain of God, which is Zion, was known as. It's a, it's a hill, right on hill, where the tent was pitched. And that's where that uh, the Ark of the Covenant was kept, uh, and then the the Davidic order of worship kind of begins from that day on. There's a huge celebration. He kind of throws a party for the entire nation. He's distributing cakes and whatnot. Uh, David is just exuberant. He is just uh, you know beyond uh, happy and whatnot. But just look at the way he he set it up. For example, uh, it says David appointed four thousand musicians plus four thousand gatekeepers and two hundred and eighty-eight prophetic singers, not just singers, prophetic singers, right? Uh, who ministered day and night to make petition to give thanks to the Lord and to praise the Lord. Four thousand. Okay, 4,000 musicians, or I can wrap my head around it, or you know, force myself to wrap my head around it. But 4,000 gatekeepers, I'm like, what is happening? How many gates? Or what, you know, what's the layout? What did the layout look like? You know, but then um, see the way he was organized it uh, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So it's just um, day and night, 
day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. This kind of Davidic order of worship went on for 33 years. Right? 33 years. Um, I mean, it may not seem like a lot. Ah, 33 years, yeah. Uh, but yeah, try doing that. <laughs> right? Um, it was so impactful, it was so powerful uh, that every other king who came after David, uh, right, which we'll learn, look at in just a second, uh, and whoever reinstated the Davidic order of worship was successful. And there was revival in the land. Okay, but uh, we, yeah, we'll just look at it in just a second. So, um, and so in David, in David's tabernacle, everything was extravagant. The best they could offer to God it was what was offered. The best that they could offer, right, was what was offered. Four thousand musicians. Uh, it's, 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 yeah. It's just to say crazy will, will be an understatement. <laughs> 4,000 musicians, 288 singers, uh, day and night, night and day. We read all about it in First Chronicles 25, verse 1 to 8. Um, and then and we also see that there was order in terms of every, uh, there were 24 groups of uh, or teams, so to speak. There were roster, my favorite word as a worship pastor, isn't it, JP? <laughs> Is uh, roster. Uh, there were 24 groups um, and singers. Uh, there were ranks. There was, again, order, just like an army, like what we learned in the last class. Uh, if you read First Chronicles 25, you would see everybody, all of them, were under the supervision of the king. Okay? If you just go through First Chronicles 25, 1 to 8, uh, you'll see. Um, and they were all highly skilled. Okay, so they were they were organized. That means there was a roster. Uh, you know, uh, that means there was a, someone who was taking care of worship team administration. Right? There was administrative duties. That means okay, I'm going to play in the temple. I'm just going to show up whenever I feel like. I'm not going to show up whenever I don't feel like. This morning I don't feel like praising God. I'll play an instrument. So I'm not going to come into work. It was not an option. It at least it didn't didn't seem like that to them. Right. Uh, there was order. Uh, there was uh, there was submissive uh, under the supervision of the leadership, um, right? And they were all highly skilled uh, musicians. We'll learn more about this uh, next year in detail on this chapter. Okay. Um, and so, as mentioned, right? Every king after King David, who followed this Davidic order of worship. Uh, saw breakthroughs, spiritual breakthroughs, deliverances, uh, military victories, etc., etc. Right, um, and you can read more, all about them. Um, so Solomon, uh, we're on page ninety. Solomon instructed that worship in the temple should be in accordance with the Davidic order. Okay, uh, Jehoshaphat, um, he defeated Moab and Ammon by setting singers up in accordance with the Davidic order singers at the front of an army singing at the great uh, singing the great Hallel right Jehoshaphat reinstated reinstated Davidic worship in the temple Joash another king Hezekiah Josiah Ezra and Nehemiah right uh, returning from Babylon uh, reinstated Davidic worship um, right. Uh, once again, we'll learn about, um, in detail about all those, um, you know, uh, these things in your next semester. Uh, worship in the course, worship ministry. Okay. But whatever David did seemed to have touched the heart of God uh, so much. And there could be so many things that we can discuss on what touched the heart of God, but then that every king who kind of followed that order had success saw success and then we go on to see sometime some 250 to 300 years later prophet amos prophesies in, in amos chapter 9 verse 11 to 13 right so can i request uh, someone to read amos chapter 9 verse 11 to 13 uh, the scriptures that is in the notes please
Amos chapter 9 verse 11 to 13. On the day I will rise up the tabernacle of David which has fallen down and repair its damages. I will rise up its ruin and re rebuild it as it is in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Ezo, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does this thing. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the poor man shall take over the reaper and the trader of grace, him who sows seed. The mountain shall drip with sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. Amen. Thanks, Jeffina. Right. So um, we see that okay from verse eleven, it goes on. It starts. It starts by saying, "On that day, I will raise up." God is saying, "I will raise up the tabernacle of David, right, which which has fallen down and repaired its damages, and I will raise it up its ruins and rebuild it, as in the days of old." Now, most of the times in in the in in worship community around the world, uh, we only seem to speak about that first line. Uh, these are the days where God is rebuilding the tabernacle of David. It's a very famous and a popular phrase in the worship community around the world. God is rebuilding the tabernacle of David. But then, look at the following verse. Why? What's the purpose behind it? Is that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the Gentiles who are called by my name. Gentiles, right? Remember, uh, in the scriptures, there are only two kinds of people. One, the people in the covenant, and the other are the people not in the covenant. The other Gentiles, right? So the Edomites, uh, or Edom, uh, are the Canaanites, uh, uh, the, who are also known as Gentiles. They will be brought to him. Basically, evangelism, winning souls for the kingdom. Right? God is saying he would rebuild the tabernacle, restore the tabernacle of David as it was in the past. So he would do this so that the Gentiles would be brought into his kingdom. Right? And so uh, it goes on to say that the harvest will be so plentiful that the reapers will be, still be busy gathering in the harvest uh, from the previous season. That means there will be so much of winning of souls who will be added to the kingdom of God in the, uh, uh, you know, as a result of the tabernacle of David being rebuilt. Right? And we see that uh, in scriptures, uh, for example, in Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29, uh, again, where Joel prophesies about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which happens on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, uh, right? We all, we all know what happens. So the, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit baptism takes place. As, um, there's like uh, amazing outpouring of the Spirit. Uh, and then 3,000 people are added you know, to the church, right? The gospel had spread among the Gentiles, uh, right? There was, um, the church is growing exponentially uh, at, at, at a crazy uh, rate. And then, you know, long story short, uh, you know, there was uh, some kind of discussion or a debate about, okay, what about these Gentiles who are being saved? Do they begin to, uh, should they get circumcised and begin to practice all uh, the Jewish traditions? And all this debate was happening. And then James uh, in Acts chapter 15, verse 16 and 17, he says this, right? After this, I will return. Like, you know, this is James and he, you know, completely inspired by the Holy Spirit, he's writing that I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does all these things. Right? So, guys. The early church was being the tabernacle of David in a spiritual sense. Like, as in, when we talk about the tab rebuilding the tabernacle of David, it's not a literal physical thing now. Okay? It is a spiritual, in a spiritual sense, what Amos prophesied in Amos chapter 9, verse 11 and 12 I will re re rebuild, restore David's tabernacle so that the Gentiles will come in. After the outpouring of the Holy Spirit uh, on the day of Pentecost, we see Gentiles being added to the church. 
And so that, in a spiritual sense, David's tabernacle was being rebuilt. And then James is prophesying what Amos said. Right? Um, and so there is a direct relationship between the offering up of continuous worship and intercession and the winning of souls to the Lord. Right? There is a direct connection between prayer, worship, and intercession that leads to winning of the souls for his kingdom. Right? Are you guys with me so far? Yeah. Any thoughts? Any questions? All right. Type a yes or a no or a maybe in the chat section, just so I know you're alive. I have a small question. Okay. Um, so what we're saying is the tabernacle of David is established uh, and rebuilt already when uh, the, the time of Pentecost, or are we still uh, pressing in for that? Because and when we hear the worship movements talk about this, so what is the what is the significance of that at this age? Right. Hey, so um, it's rem remembering about Joel's prophecy, right? Uh, Joel says that in the last days I will pour out my spirit. All the sons and all your sons and daughters will see visions and and whatnot, right? Now, what we read about Joel, what he says in Joel chapter 2, we don't see all of it happening on the day of Pentecost, right, or in Acts chapter 2. But then yet, Peter says, this is what Joel prophesied about. Okay, and so that means uh, it still, I mean, it still goes on to say that, uh, and why do we pre talk about Holy Spirit baptism, when we at least teach about Holy Spirit baptism in churches is, we refer to Acts chapter 2 and everything that happened in the early church. And that's why we press in, right? We don't stop pressing and saying, okay, this happened only then, and no, so we stop pressing in now. So we don't believe in cessation. At least that's not what we teach at ABC, right? And so therefore, because, you know, that was a symbol uh, that was referred to David's tabernacle being built, I mean, which James kind of, uh, you know, refers to in the scriptures, is it's the same thing that we as the local church are called to do which is the great commission isn't it go out and bring add people into his kingdom so to speak right in doing so david's uh you know uh, there is a restoration of david's tabernacle and so i mean our duty for, is as a local church we are to be the house of prayer and worship and as a result of that uh, people are getting added to his kingdom so we, we in my opinion uh, we need to press in for that yeah, yeah, got it. Thanks. Okay, so um, that's where we're at, guys. As in, uh, so as a local church, uh, you know, as we give ourselves to continuous worship and intercession, uh, you know, we will see large gatherings of souls being added to the kingdom of God, um, right? And. At the bottom of page 91, there's a section where we talk about uh, the house of prayer and worship. Okay, there's a question here by Sid. Before, okay, let's just pause before we continue. It says, Pastor, as we are talking about the culture and Gentiles, uh, a question often raises in my mind, that is, as Jesus was himself a Jew and we are walking in his footsteps, then why we Christians only have three festivals? Good Friday, Easter, Christmas. Why don't we celebrate the festivals like Passover or other festivals referred in the Bible? Because uh, I don't think we have to. Um, see, we. <laughs> uh, see, I'm a Christian, right? Uh, Jesus was a Jew because he, you know, he comes from the people. But then we are, we are all become his children uh, in faith. It doesn't say we all become a Jew in faith. Uh, so <laughs> that is that is my understanding. I mean, there are certain things that you all want to, I mean, you want to practice what the Jewish traditions of, I mean, there are certain families that I know of who practices certain festivals. Uh, sometimes they take it a bit far, <laughs> uh, which is uh, not necessary, but, uh, but, but that freedom is there. So, you know, 
I mean, I, I there are families that make a certain Jewish prayers uh, before the meal, after the meal. Uh, they follow the different, as in certain practices, or uh, on you know, there there's so many things, isn't it? So. Um, but also festivals, when you talk about festivals, and if you're studying about the different festivals of the Jewish tradition, um, I think they have about seven, uh, seven, I think I forget, I studied it a long time ago. Uh, out of the seven, I think four is already fulfilled. So, and then there's the rest three, which is still kind of prophetic. So if we start talking about it, we can keep talking about it. But um, as remembering, you know, Good Friday is Passover, isn't it? Remembering what God did for us, um, you know, and, and then Easter is celebrating His resurrection. Christmas is celebrating His birth. That works for me. That does. It's enough for me. <laughs> and I celebrate His goodness every day of my life. So, um, yeah, that's about it. Too. Cool. Um, so house of prayer uh, and worship. In Isaiah chapter 56, verse 6 and 7, um, it says, Also the sons of the foreigner who join themselves to the Lord. Look at that language there, right? Also the sons of the foreigner, which is referring to, in this language, Gentiles who join themselves to the Lord, who've come in, who you know, who've immersed, baptized themselves into the Lord, uh, to serve Him and to love the name of the Lord, to be His servants. Everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant, even them I will bring to my holy mountain, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. Right? It's a pretty famous verse, isn't it? We've heard that quite a bit. Uh, right? My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. And we see that Jesus kind of uh, uh, quoting that as well in Matthew chapter 21, verse 12 and 14. 13 especially, he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Jesus was pretty angry uh, in this situation. We all know what happened. He turns the, he literally turned the tables upside down. <laughs> As we say it, right? Uh, took a whip and uh, man, that would have been quite a scene to watch Jesus go on a rampage, isn't it? It's like, wow. <laughs> Isn't it? I mean, there's, there's so many things that uh, happen in the Bible we'd like to see. You know, as, as kids, we used to play this game. It's like, hey, if there's one Bible instance that uh, you wish you were present, which one would it be? One from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament? As kids, we used to play that. I'm not sure if you played it, but then we played it. Um, some would say, oh, no, I wish I was there when fire came down from you know heaven when Elijah prayed and called out. Some would say, oh, I wish I was there when the Red Sea parted and, and stuff like that, you know. Uh, so this is one of those moments, right? <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, man, I wish I was there <laughs> when Jesus got uh, angry and turned the tables upside down. Must have been quite a scene. Okay. This is all, all in the lighter note, guys. So, <laughs> uh, but anyway, so uh, he says, "My house shall be shall be called the house of prayer." Jesus was taking that uh, very seriously, uh, right? Um, it, it meant quite quite a bit to him. So. And notice that in Isaiah 56, it says uh, once again that the sons of the foreigner who, uh, who joined themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, will be added as well. Right? And so Gentiles being brought into the house of prayer, right? this reveals to us that as God's people establish themselves as a house of prayer for all nations, there will be uh, you know, as 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 a consequence of that, uh, you know, we will see people being added to the kingdom. It's once again reiterating that point, right? Um, as we, as His people, build a house of prayer, uh, for emphasize and focus on that, uh, you know, people who don't know the Lord will be added to His kingdom. Okay, uh, let's take a visit to the throne room. Page ninety-two. 
141 verse 2 it says let my prayer be set before you as incense the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice right? let my prayer be set before you as incense let the lifting up of my hands uh, as the evening sacrifice uh, but there are two things that happens in in the throne room time and time again when you read when you start reading from ch chapter four we read about the whole, the four living creatures right uh, we see that each had six wings and they were crying to one another holy 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 uh, and then we see that uh which is that in revelation chapter five verse eight to ten it says now when he had taken a scroll the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb each having a harp and golden bowls of full of incense okay uh, if you want to you can highlight it those two words there a harp and bowl of incense right uh, the harp represents worship uh, the bowl of incense represents prayer right incense intercession right uh, once again we read about it in the revelation chapter 8 verse 3 and 4 um, from then another angel having a golden censer came and stood at the altar he has given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne and the smoke of incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before god from the angel's hands right and um and so it, this is in the very throne room of god okay um just imagine with me if you will um just, just imagine a palace right a, a royal palace it, it it will have um a lot of rooms isn't it it will have a lot of rooms uh you know guest room bedroom hall dining room blah 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 okay it will have a lot of rooms palaces are big they're huge um the throne room would be a one of a kind in the entire palace. So, if uh, let's say palace is, uh, is this is just for uh, an an example sake, right? If a palace is uh, say heaven is as big as a palace, for example, just so we understand. Okay, there are a lot of rooms, there are a lot of spaces, uh, and then there's one room where the king seats is is seated. And the throne room is where the king would sit and make a lot of decisions, like you know, a political decisions, um, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's where you get the audience with the king. And so, there's throne room is the real deal kind of things. Okay, that's uh, that's where the king is seated on the throne, right? Um, and all of this is happening there in the very throne room of God. There is worship and intercession rising. Right? And then we go on to see that in um, for Revelation chapter 5, verse 11 and 12, that everybody is involved. Nobody is a spectator. Right? They were all just crying out, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches, wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Right? There are seven words that's mentioned there. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. Right? And we just saw that worship and prayer is happening in the very throne room of God. And so it just goes to point out to say that worship covers the sevenfold realm of honor due to the king. When you talk about the, the worthiness of Jesus, right? We, we talk, when we talk about the worthiness of Jesus, all these seven words that's mentioned is attributed to, to, to someone who can have, uh, who's worthy of it all, as we say, right? Uh, when we sing those uh, words, he's worthy of it all. What does that all mean? It's those seven things. Why are these seven words so important is what we look at, right? So um, what is the lamb who is slain to receive? Power. 
That means power is influence, authority, dominion, and sovereignty. Sovereign means what? Single reign. That's what sovereign is. When we say our God is a sovereign God, that means he will, his kingdom reigns forever and ever. Single reign, right? There is no other kingdom after his kingdom. There is no end to his kingdom like that. Um, you know, it uh, handles Messiah says, hallelujah, hallelujah. He shall reign forever and ever. Right, uh, so his kingdom has no end. So there's influence, authority, dominion, sovereignty, and riches is all the wealth and possessions. Wisdom is all the knowledge, understanding, skill. Strength is all might and ability. Honor is all respect, reverence, and submission given to the king. Glory is the splendor, majesty, greatness, and awe because of who he is and what he does. Blessing is all the praise, worship, adoration, admiration, love, and devotion offered to the king. And so, worship covers the sevenfold realm of honor due to the king. Our worship, right? A worship of a believer, right? And seven represents completion or perfection. Perfect honor for the king who uh, king is when he is honored in all seven realms, right? That's it's just it's, it's just beautiful and to know that this is what's happening in the very throne room of God, right? And we, we, We'll pause here uh, And just for us to you know To kind of emphasize Let worship an intercession uh, be on earth as it is in heaven, right? Uh, let our churches, uh, our, our local church, uh, should be uh, like as Jesus taught us to pray, you know, on earth as it is in heaven, right? And when that happens, it's like, you know, spiritually, David's tabernacle is being built in a spiritual sense, and then God is honored. Is worshipped, prayers are being lifted up because his house is called the house of prayer. And as a result of all that, those who don't know the Lord are being added to his kingdom, are brought in, uh, you know, to, to into his kingdom, right? Um, so we'll pause there, we'll take a break, and we'll resume um, the next session. Okay? Right, see you guys. <laughs> 